Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined today in studio, as I always am, by President Wyatt. Scott, it's good to see you again. It's good to see you, Steve. Thanks. We are uh, sitting far away from each other to be COVID compliant, and uh, that's, I think, appropriate for today's discussion. We, uh, in our... uh, in our 2021 series, we've been talking about innovations and and what has gone right for some of the innovative things that SUU's done, and maybe some of the things that didn't go quite the way we had hoped. and uh, And one of those has everything to do with healthcare, and uh, and so that's certainly on a topic on everybody's mind right now. Why don't you introduce our podcast guest? I will. We are so delighted to have. Rita Osborne joining us today. Rita is the Executive Director of the Center for Rural Health. Welcome, Rita. Thank you so much, President Wyatt and Steve. Well, you have one of our um, university's most fascinating innovations. And, um, And it's one that I quickly go to when someone asks me the question, tell me something really amazing about Southern Utah University. Well, thank you. Uh, and I'm not. That's a teaser. So I'm not going to answer the question yet um, about the actual uh, elevator speech that I give people when when I talk about it. But okay, so tell us what the Center for Rural Health is. Sure. So the Utah Center for Rural Health started out in 1997 on this campus with a federal grant from uh, based at the University of Utah. It's called the uh, Area Health Education Centers. So AHECs are national. Almost every state in the country has an AHEC centered at a medical school. And each of those AHEC grants then starts regional centers. And the goal is to work with the healthcare pathway to recruit and retain more healthcare professionals in rural and underserved communities. We do that by bringing external industry partnerships into the internal education process. Uh, We listen to industry. We let them kind of guide the direction of where the needs are. And then we determine how to connect our emerging workforce to those career opportunities. So you can imagine that healthcare has for decades just had incredible shortages, especially when it comes to rural and underrepresented communities. It's really challenging to find physicians and nurses and pharmacists to go to work in um, Panguit, Utah, for example, or Beaver, Utah, or some of our even more frontier counties. So um, AHECs around the country have been given the charge to work on this issue and develop pathways that would start with high school students, getting them excited. The literature shows that. Um, a high percentage of students deselect from choosing a healthcare career field very early on in junior high school, middle school. So we want to keep that student motivated through high school and uh, get them to one of our universities, especially Southern Utah University, so that their career goals can um, manifest themselves. And then hopefully return them to practice in a rural community where they've grown up and, and served. And so here at SUU, as I said, our center started in 1997. We weren't doing much with undergrad students at the time. We were working with high school students. We cover 19 counties in rural Utah. I say from Nephi South on the western side of the state, and border to border on the eastern side. So I get a lot of um, windshield time, as you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, I I love seeing beautiful rural Utah at its finest, and uh, it's it's very exciting to get out to those communities and visit and uh, 
and talk with folks out there and, and listen to the challenges that they have as well. So at SUU, there wasn't a lot going on with pre-med, pre-professional advising back in those days. And we would get maybe two to three students into medical school each year. So we approached our program office at the University of Utah at the medical school. And we said, you know, what can we do to carve out some seats for our rural students? Many med schools across the country have designated rural seats, which is, is exciting for students coming from rural or underrepresented backgrounds. And they said, eh, we're just not there right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, the dean of admissions at the time uh, became a, a fantastic mentor for me and, and, and still is. And, and he said, you know, though, he said, you, you've kind of hit on some things. Uh, we're just changing the way we look at students. We're looking at, more, at students more holistically. He says, I'll help you build a program. And uh, he helped us build the Rural Health Scholars Program. We looked at what some other states were doing, and we uh, looked at what was going to fit best for our students, and we created the Rural Health Scholars Program. So it's a program geared for students entering into a healthcare career field. I dare say over 50% every fall want to become pre-med or, you know, go to medical school. We work with them very closely through that pipeline. Um, as you can imagine, some of those classes are very challenging for students. So we provide support for those students in the early days with tutoring and mentoring and uh, uh, coaching along the way. It's a very daunting process for many of our students who are first-generation college uh, students coming from backgrounds where just coming onto a college campus is challenging. That was my upbringing. I had never been on a college campus. I was first gen. Uh, and so I, I really relate to these students. And it's just been wonderful to create a program where we can have a nurturing environment for students like that. Um, we, When they join our program, they hopefully join as freshmen, but they can join at any point in time when they decide they want to go into a healthcare career. We have many students who come back as non-traditional students and say, and I've always wanted to do this, but I didn't know how. So we help them throughout that process. They take specific classes. Some of our classes are taught by our local healthcare professionals. We have a local ophthalmologist that teaches for us. We have a local optometrist, several local dentists. Um, so we bring in professionals from the community to help coach our students as well. So the students in the program for you know, the whole time that they're here at undergraduate, um, at the undergraduate level, and we coach them through their entrance exam. We uh, help teach them how to interview and how to do that onerous application and the secondary applications that come with it. Uh, and then hopefully we get to celebrate their acceptances once they find out they've been accepted at a healthcare graduate program. So that's, that's our elevator pitch. Uh, <laughs> so you... The, the, center, the Utah Center for Rural Health has a whole series of programs, and the Rural Health Scholars is one of those programs, and you started it as um, kind of a pitch to the University of Utah Medical School that why don't you keep a few spots open for rural students because a student that grew up in a rural town is more likely to go back there, right? Exactly. The literature shows that. And we yeah. know that, um, you know, if their family is from that rural community, they're going to fit in that rural community. You know, our federal government has a loan repayment program, and that's been the Band-Aid solution. It's great, but uh, I will tell you, we had a, a physician in Kanab, and she was fantastic. She worked there for eight years, but she was from Tennessee, and she paid back her loans by doing the federal loan repayment program, and then she went back to Tennessee. And so the long-term solution is finding those from those communities and getting them back. They can still get loan repayment while they're back in their rural communities, but guess what? They're going to stay there, and that's, that's yeah. the solution. We track our alumni and and. Over 30% of our primary care physicians in rural Utah trace their roots to our program here. 
which is pretty cool. That's amazing. What I'm, what's interesting to me about this story is that you went to the University of Utah and said, can you keep some spots open for us? And they said, sorry, we can't do that. So then you said, okay, let's figure out how to get our rural students admitted. Mm-hmm. Um, not based on where they grew up, but based on pure qualifications. Exactly. And then be- and- between you and the Dean of Admissions, you carved out or you created this program that allowed you to prepare students precisely for what it was that the University of Utah was looking for. And that ends up being what other medical schools are looking for. And exactly. so what so what starts out as, can you give us an exception, ended up becoming a, a program where the rural students are actually as prepared or more prepared or more qualified to get in. I think our listeners would be fascinated to hear the results. Yes. Uh, The results have been amazing. Um, Even if we, when we went two decades ago to the University of Utah Medical School and asked for seats, we would have been happy to have had five seats carved out for our rural students. Do you know, last year we had over 30, well, 32 students gain acceptance to medical school. Wow. So, so we've far surpassed, I think, any dreams that we could have um, had back in those days. And by using a rubric that the University of Utah Medical School has for its students, uh, we have found that when our students attain that level of maturity in their um, process of preparing for medical school, that they do exceed what other medical schools are looking for. And that, that certainly has contributed to our students' success with, with medical school. But then the other piece of that is those many, many students that come in that door as freshmen thinking they want to go to medical school and finding out that that may not be the best fit for them. Our program also then allows them to explore other health careers. So the physician assistant, career field, optometry, podiatry, dentistry, pharmacy, uh, the whole gamut of healthcare careers are then open to them. And we also pipeline students into those programs. So last year in total, we had about 90 students that did gain admission to healthcare graduate programs. And before this program started, it was two to three or five? Two to, yes, two to three that were getting into medical school each year. <laughs> Those are stunning numbers. That's a yeah. that's like from two to three to twenty three, uh, or yeah, thirty two, thirty two, uh, ten times. You get ten times the admission. Yeah. Yes, and it uh, and it is just um, wonderful to see students achieve their goals. As you know, many many of our students choose to come to SUU because we offer something that our larger counterparts don't offer. We offer. Uh, engaged learning, experiential learning. We offer small class sizes, and our students benefit by that, especially when they come from a rural or underrepresented background. And similarly in our program, we offer, I joke that we're concierge advising. (laughs) uh, We (laughs) have, uh, we take take care of our students the whole way, and, and we get to see those students grow through that process. And I'll be honest, I just had a student this semester who uh, was in our beginning class and approached our instructor of that class this semester, and he said, you know, after sitting in this class for a couple of weeks, I realized I don't want to do this. And guess what? We're just as excited about that as for the student that does get into medical school, because so many students are, are maybe pressured into choosing a healthcare career or going to a graduate program. And, and it really does have to come from within. You need a lot of fire in your belly to, to get through uh, medical school and, and our healthcare graduate program. So we're just ex- as excited that they're not wasting their educational experience and time and money, and they can move on to something that is going to suit them better. What's, what's, what's been impressive to me about this program is that, and you've described these pieces, that 
you're advising, tutoring, um, all of these kinds of things that help students know if medical school or dental school or whatever it might be is for them and to help them be successful along that track. But mm -hmm. but a student who comes in as a freshman and signs up for your Rural Health Scholars program isn't just being helped to graduate and uh, know what their career path ought to be, but you're actually helping them create their resume from day one. Exactly. We focus on experiential learning, um, Gradu a successful candidate. Yeah. yeah, graduation. Normally at a university, we think of graduation as the outcome. But that's, mm -hmm. but that's not really your outcome because graduation is just a means to the ends. It's a step mm -hmm. because graduation yeah, says that you can now apply to get into medical school. So it's not done until you've completed your graduate program and then passed your boards and now you're working and then the clock starts over for residency if you're in the physician realm but uh, most pre-med students need to have about 15 different uh, distinct activities or experiences on a successful application for medical school 15 so dis as you, distinct 15. activities yes each lasting Perhaps over 25 hours. We're not talking about, oh, I just volunteered at the um, Utah Summer Games for five hours. They need to be a commitment. And that includes things like research, patient exposure, job shadowing, service, and leadership. If a student starts getting their resume prepared as a junior or senior, uh, it's yeah. almost too late, isn't it? It's, it's almost too late. If their goal is medical school, uh, that becomes a challenge. We call that double timing it. <laughs> and, uh, we will work <laughs> with that student to, to double time it, but uh, oftentimes they have to stretch out their career in undergrad a little bit uh, to achieve some of those things. When I was an undergrad, and Steve, I don't know what your experience was, but as a freshman, I wasn't thinking about graduate school, even though I knew that was my goal. I was just thinking about um, being successful in my undergraduate experience. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's pretty common. I just want to be successful as a freshman, and then I want to be successful as a sophomore. Right. And then, oh, I need to start thinking about, oh, I've got this and this to do to prepare for graduate school. But that's... When you're, t when you're 18 years old, four or five years down the road is like an eternity. It's yeah. a quarter of your life. <laughs> That's uh -huh. so far ahead. Right. Well, you think by your junior year, if you're headed to med school, you've got to spend most of that junior year prepping for your dreaded entrance exam, the MCAT. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and that in itself takes hours every day for the students to do well on that standardized yeah. test. I have a son-in-law that has just gone through this entire process, is now in his second year of residency at, uh, uh -huh. in El Paso, Texas. And, uh, and it has been uh, very interesting to watch him uh, in his, because he married our daughter while he was still an undergraduate student. And you are exactly right. It is, uh, in fact, he, he in many ways fits the, the bill of, for what we've been talking about today from a rural community and so forth. And, it uh, it is an astonishing amount of work just to get ready to go to med school. It is, and and really uncovering is this the right fit for me? Appreciating each of our students' journey. You know, I have students all the time who say, "Oh, I want to be just like so and so. He got in at the University of Utah. I want to do exactly the same service he did, exactly the same research." Each student has their own journey in this process, and they have to find the experiences that fit for them. Um, many of our students aren't able to do service Monday through Fridays at all. They're committed. They've got classes. They've got work. Uh, they might find that service needs to be um, going to visit care centers with their family in tow on a weekend. <laughs> and um, we help them think through that to find those right fits. Rita, we, we live in a rural community here, um, and, and we all love it. Um, I know the president and I grew up in larger 
communities uh, as we were, uh, you know, going through school. But my, I guess my question is, in in my program in music technology, we we frequently had to um, do what we call the reprogramming process, where where students would come in thinking one thing about themselves. I'm you know I'm a bassoon major, and that's what I am. At that's what I got my graduate or my undergraduate degree in, and and the the reprogramming part was, you know, you need to think of yourself differently. Is is there is there a mindset challenge for students that come from rural um, communities regarding their ability to get into med school, or do you have to uh, do you have to work with students on that mindset? Sure, we do some presentations on the imposter syndrome. Many of our students just don't know that they've got what it takes to do this, and and so we come from this with an asset based approach. You know, these are the things that you bring to the table. And um, if you truly, you know, have the passion to do this, you can. Uh, I encourage my students all the time who come from rural Utah who, I, you know, I always ask a question in our application workshop where we help them write their personal statement. And I'll say, how many of you started work uh, before the age of 18? And, and almost the whole class raises their hand. And then right. I say, how many of you had a farming, ranching experience? You may even have helped your grandparents do farming and ranching. And, yep. and usually half of the class raises their hands. And I say, do you realize that you are unique? That sets you apart as unique. You think about the typical medical school admissions team that's reviewing an application. They don't get to read about, you know, the students that get to cut out cancer eyes of the cattle. They don't get to read those things. So they keep reading your personal statement and they get to learn more about you. And we try to encourage students to bring out that which is unique within them. And for everybody, that's very different, especially if they started work before the age of 18, if they contributed part of their income to the family support, if they helped buy their own school clothes. Do you know that's unique in the audience of who's applying to medical school? Interesting. So definitely, we do often have to have those conversations, though, where we have to share with a student that the traditional path they chose, which might be four years at university and then helping into medical school, may not happen. But we also look for the way to get there. And, and that might be doing a post-baccalaureate program or choosing an alternate career. Uh, but we coach them through that process as well. What do you think... Um if so, if uh, if one of our listeners was uh, dialed into this today and said, "This is really an amazing program. I'd like to do something like it or something different." But what can I learn from this experience? What What do you think the lessons that you've learned um, over innovating on this rural health scholars program over the last almost twenty years? Mm-hmm. You know, at the counterpart institutions that I'm sure you all attended, and, and, and I hail from a, a more suburban environment as well, we have a pre-health advising office that is pretty um, uh, flat, that they hand you a checklist, and, and um, you check off the boxes. In fact, we call those students box checkers because their applications often look similar, is is digging in and, and allowing you student to tell their story, finding time to listen to that story and then help them craft their their personal experience into, you know, who they're going to become. You know, our students have so many multiple stressors on them right now, um, especially at a rural school like ours. Uh, we have a, a lot of first generation students. We have students that need to work to keep their debt low. Um, we do experience a challenge with our students committing the time and energy. So helping them find that time and energy to get through these things is, is good. Um, our lessons learned, we wish we would have created some things earlier on to make it easier for students to um, stay in touch with us. Uh, one of our goals now is to build an app so that our students, getting in touch with students is very challenging. So Keeping students connected is is a secret to, uh, and and that evolves as each generation moves through this process. I think, um, 
And one of the things we've learned is develop collaborations with our industry partners. So we have an amazing relationship with um, our large healthcare employers throughout the state, um, places where our students can achieve unique opportunities. We could not do this in just the, the vacuum of our academic institution. We rely on those partners to provide opportunities for our students out in the community. So developing those partnerships is key as well. What's one thing you wish you knew when you started this? Something that you know today uh, that you wish you'd known when you started? <laughs> I, I heard that sound. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, personally, it's the responsibility I feel for, you know, helping the students achieve their goals and, and having those conversations. Um, I, I also think it's important to appreciate where we are I love our SUU marketing team, and they have done a fantastic job of running our acceptance statistics up that flagpole. And, uh, you know, our acceptance statistics for our group is, on a five-year basis, anywhere from 80 to 98% of our applying group gets accepted, at least to one healthcare graduate program. And that's pretty significant. Yeah. <laughs> Most Schools our size do hover around the 65 to 75% range because they have small groups. And our larger institutions really only have about a 45 to 50% acceptance rate. So our, lo- our wonderful marketing team loves to raise those uh, statistics up the flagpole so much so that I've had parents uh, contact me and say, you know, we're deciding to send our student to XYZ school, an urban counterpart of ours, and I have to really educate them about who we are and how we're different. We are not an R1 institution. Right. Our students struggle to get research. And um, our students typically matriculate, actually, about 60 to 70 percent of our Uh, matriculating group each year matriculates to an osteopathic medical school. So osteopathic medical schools are a little bit different than allopathic medical schools. Osteopathic schools produce DOs, doctors of osteopathy, and then allopathic uh, medical schools are MDs. Anymore in the practice environment, you wouldn't even know the difference. We have um, medical practices here in Cedar City where you have an MD practicing side-by-side with a DO they're doing exactly the same thing. They make exactly the same money. Right. Um, it's a little bit different pathway and, and traditionally focuses on primary care. And it lends itself well to who we are as a rural institution. But when I have a parent call and say, you know, you've got this 80, 90% acceptance rate. I want my son to go to Harvard Medical School. Unfortunately, we've not had anybody get into Harvard Medical School. We're not... Um, and, and having those conversations has had to evolve, and it's very challenging um, with that. So we've created a document that we give to parents that's called Above and Beyond the Statistics uh, that really does talk about where our students get in. And uh, so, so that's come from our success, but it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge some, of, some days. Yeah, so you've hit on an interesting point is, is that as we talk about the successes in a soundbite, it doesn't really communicate mm-hmm. the full story. And, uh, and sometimes we have to be very careful about managing expectations so that people know exactly what they're getting. That's a, that's a very interesting uh, part of this whole thing. For me, mm-hmm. in, uh, in talking about your success, it's less about um, recruiting students to get into the pre-med program. And it's more about, this is an example of an amazing program at a school that has individual attention. Mm. Correct, yeah. And it, and it feels like two or three or four of these kind of programs <clears throat> become very illustrative of the institution as a whole, and it raises the elevation or the stature of, of every other program. But you you also have a limit to how many students could be in this program, um, so <laughs> it's it's not yes. like it's not like the university can make its future growth based on <laughs> the rural health scholars. True, true. I think our science faculty would would uh, not be 
very encouraged by that. Uh, we have grown um, the number of students who do come here, and we have uh, several hundred students in this program. But you have to realize they're in, you know, that's across four to five years. And so, you know, our matriculating group each year is about 90 to 100 that ends up, you know, matriculating to a healthcare career program. Well, in biology, which is a typical pre-med major, is our largest major. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that um, a lot of students are coming here for this program and this type of experience, even if it's not the program. Sure. And and the interesting message is um, you can have any major you want. You could be a music major. To and get to medical school. Many healthcare graduate programs appreciate that you've diversified a lot of your undergrad experience exploring something that you're passionate about. We have Spanish majors, psychology majors, nutrition majors, the whole gamut, business majors. So as long as they're doing well in their sciences and and, uh, achieve their science prereqs, then they're fine. Well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. And um, sometime we should talk about all the other innovations that you've done. There just isn't <laughs> enough time in one show. But, but yeah, this is well, one of many programs. And, uh, and something else that's impressive about it is that you haven't taken this Rural Health Scholars program and just uh, kept it kind of as the secret sauce for Southern Utah University because you've shared it with other schools and it's Definitely. I've, I've presented about this nationally, and uh, we're excited to share what works here. And uh, we've had other states adapt it to, to their states. Um, and we're able to build, like I said, collaboratives. Our, our center is nimble enough to be responsive to community needs. And so when a need pops up, we can hopefully address that and utilize our students in those opportunities. And, and that really has been part of that secret sauce. So one last question for you, Rita, and thank you so much for joining us today. Here's the last question, and that is, if, if, um, if I was an entrepreneurial, spirited, or um, innovation-minded person at another institution or at Southern Utah University in different programs, what is the one piece of advice that you would give? What would you give me? Oh, As I'm trying to start I, something, you know, what, what's the one piece of advice? I, I think it's build those partnerships. It's really important. You can't do this in a vacuum. And rely on your student successes. Our alumni are our greatest champions. If I have a student thinking about our program, a parent thinking about a program, I can easily tap into our alumni network and uh, uh, and build our credibility and our quality is keep the quality there. We never scrimp when it comes to our students. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. We've had as our guest today via phone, Rita Osborne. Rita is, uh, she heads up the Utah Center for Rural Health and the Rural Health Scholars Program here at SUU, both terrifically innovative programs. And Rita, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners for listening. And we'll be back again with another podcast real soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.